Namaste. Konnichiwa. It is a great pleasure for me to extend my best wishes to all of you on the occasion of the 152nd birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi being celebrated today across the world. In this year when India is celebrating its 75th year of independence as Azadi ka Amrit Mahotsav, Mahatma Gandhi's philosophy of inclusive, global and practical life is of eternal value. Mahatma Gandhi was not only the focal point of India's freedom struggle, but he left his invaluable teachings for the whole of humanity. Gandhi ji always centered his domain of thoughts on human beings and believed in service of humankind. He chose not to prescribe utopian ideas and preferred creating social good as compared to personal and individual accomplishments. Gandhi ji was a symbol of practice what is preached and led by illustrating and setting examples. He believed in collective action and collective achievements. When he talked of Gram Swaraj, he did not talk of any particular individual getting empowered. Rather, he favored the entire village getting empowered and integrated with larger and wider ecosystems. Gandhi ji is fondly remembered as Papu father of the Indian nation. He was embodiment of virtues such as truth, civil disobedience and non-violence. The simple ways in which he explained these complicated concepts allowed to imbibe them so effortlessly that they became an individual's personal characteristics. Gandhiji's teachings are followed not only in India but all around the world and are universal. He defined God through truth and service of mankind. He defined a supreme soul through non-violence and he defined the simplicity of the outlook and approach of individuals and society. If we look at just this concept, Japan is very much an example of what could be expected from being simple but yet believe in integral humanism. When Gandhiji talked of non-violence, it was not a discourse on submission, rather it was a display of courage. He always preached that non-violence cannot be a weapon of the weak. He related truth with non-violence and defined it in the form of uttermost selflessness. To him, non-violence was not a negative concept, but a positive sense of love, which is evident from his remark. He said, the power produced by non-violence is certainly superior to all of the weapons produced by human skills. Gandhiji believed that the use of violent means must inevitably contaminate the end achieved. Another value in Gandhi's treasure of values is justice. His motto was, rather than swerving to injustice and being followed by all people, Stay with justice and be alone. Mahatma Gandhi always acted with the philosophy of seeing it necessary to demonstrate a just attitude and is an appropriate role model in raising righteous individuals who have internalized a sense of justice. Gandhiji not only brought change, but he awakened the inner strength of the people to bring about change in themselves and around them as well. On today's occasion, I would urge all of you to remember the basis and the purpose of Mahatma Gandhi's teachings and philosophies. Once again, the heartiest greetings of Gandhi Jayanti to all of you. Thank you. Arigato gozaimasu. Vaishnava Janato Tene Kahiye Jai पीड़ पर आई जानी रे वैष्णव जन तो Hey okay.
उपकार करे तो ये मन अभिमान सकले लोक मा सहुने वंदे निंदा न करे के नीरे वाच काच मन निश्चल राखे धन धन जननी ते नीरे वाच काच मन निश्चल राखे धन धन जननी रे वैष्णव जन तो तेने कहिए जे पीड़ पर जाने रे
रहित छे काम क्रोध Chiharu Takenaka of Rikkyo University in Tokyo. I have been studying the history of India for decades with the help of lots of teachers and my Indian friends. Therefore, I'm very, very honored to be invited for one of the most important days of Indian people, Gandhi Jayanti, in this year, especially when not only India and Japan, but also the whole world is struggling to overcome the COVID-19. It seems that the issue of climate change, global warming and natural disaster, as well as the issue of pandemic appear in front of us because we the human being become so arrogantly powerful to transform the benevolent nature of the globe. Today we are seeing the tsunami-like strong global waves from the nature to shaken our country and society. How can we overcome the difficult situations could we return to the old days? However, the fearful danger and severe experience will definitely open our eyes as well as our mind. In order to overcome the difficulties of the pandemic, we come to know that all of us should work together to meet this unfamiliar challenge for our survival. We need the cooperation in the country and in the world. The problem is how. Here we notice that Mahatma Gandhi and his followers already gave us precious lessons as the unique ideas and board practice. Satyagraha, Ahimsa, Ashram, Swaraj, and Swadesh. We learned about Satyagraha in South Africa. We learned about the invention of Kadi movements. We learned about non-violent civil disobedience for Swaraji. We learned about thousands and thousands of people's courageous actions in Salt March, guided by Mahatma Gandhi. These are precious lessons, not only for Indian people, but also for all of us on the earth. Gandhi was an innovator and creator 
to make our society a better place to live in, to make people grow for the future, and to make all people happy. We all can learn and train ourselves as Satyagrahi under the guidance of Gandhiji today. Come back to the year of 2021. Many people are following the ideas and practice of Satyagraha, not only in India and South Asia, but also in other parts of the world for building peace, for defending human lives and human rights, for appealing for climate change, and for many, many other goals. To fight the pandemic, we learn how people are sincerely as well as courageously working to stop the tragedy. Consciously or unconsciously, many people are becoming satyagrahi, like the examples of Mahatma and his friends. Looking back, we Japanese have been learning from Mahatma Gandhi and Indian people for a long time. It started when Gandhiji was still active to work for the future in India. Japan has a history to learn from India since we came to have the ideas and practice of Buddhism in ancient time. It is still continuing until today. In post-war Japan, particularly peace movements, together with commemoration of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, have been receiving a tremendous Shakti from Gandhiji and Indian people. I believe an answer to the crisis of climate change and this pandemic would be our global satyagraha seeking for integrity and collaboration among us and between the human being and the nature. Individual, community, humanity, earth and truth should be one. As the great Indian soul tried to achieve and tried to teach us. We the people should learn how to achieve Swaraj or self rule and self control of ourselves as a natural creature on the earth. Gandhiji is still holding a light for us in the turmoil of the 20th century. Thank you very much for sharing your precious time with me. I sincerely thank for Gandhiji and his friends and Indian people for enlightening us in this difficult time. God bless you. God bless all of us. Thank you. One
Namaste, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kazuya Ishii. I am conducting Gandhian studies at Kagawa University. It is a great honor for me to be invited uh, by the Embassy of India to celebrate the 152nd anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi's birth. First of all, I'd like to express my deep gratitude to His Excellency, Mr. Sanjay Kumar Varma, the ambassador of India to Japan uh, for this invitation, uh, and also to Mr. Taichi Watanabe, a staff member of the embassy uh, who has kindly uh, corresponded with me to arrange today's talk. As the embassy requested, I would like to talk on Gandhiji's thoughts in re relation to the current spread of COVID-19. I regret that I cannot leave Kagawa for Tokyo due to the current rules of my university. So I am sending this video message to you today. Although the public health is not my field of study, and nor am I an expert of pandemic studies in particular, I am hoping that I could say something about it from the uh, viewpoint of Gandhian studies. But first, I would like to briefly review uh, what COVID-19 is all about, especially uh, how it has spread across the world. Second, um, I am going to share with you uh, what I regard as the basic ideas of Gandhi's about civilization and society. And lastly, uh, let us see uh, if we could draw any lessons from his thoughts as we face the current expansion of this disease. Uh, it was sometime in 2019 when an unknown virus uh, started spreading in Wuhan, China. It was first said that the virus, having long stayed in bats, uh, was finally uh, transmitted to humans. Uh, like the preceding kinds of viruses that caused SARS, MARS, Ebola fever, and HIV AIDS, the current virus transmission was also believed to be a result of humans uh, having excessively destroyed nature and come into uh, close contact with wild animals. It was, however, rumored later that the virus might have happened uh, due to a leak from a laboratory at the Virus Research Institute in that city. In any case, the virus has spread all over the world uh, very rapidly and extensively. As of uh, September the 15th, uh, 2021, the number of infected people amounts to 226 million or 3% of the world population, uh, among which uh, 4.6 million people have died. Uh, while in the United States, uh, 41 million people have been infected and 664,000 have died. In India, 33 million people have been infected and 443,000 have died. The numbers of infection and death are respectively 1.6 million and 17,000 in Japan. The truth about where the virus originated is still unknown, but it is clear that it has spread mainly among people living in cities. When the Japanese government urged people not to meet with each other last year, it was impressive to read what was written by Mr. Soichi Yamashita, a farmer in Saga Prefecture, Kyushu. He mentioned in his blog that they ask us not to meet people, but there is hardly anyone we could meet here. The problem here is not coronavirus, but that there are no people around and farm fields are thus neglected. This statement uh, reminds us that the current virus expansion in overpopulated areas and community breakdown in underpopulated ones are the two sides of the same coin. 
Uh, in addition, the virus contagion is taking place across the world, a sign of globalization in which people are moving from one place to another very rapidly and frequently. When the global movement of people and commercial goods was stopped to a large extent last year, canals in Venice were said to have become purified, and so was the air about Los Angeles. It was also said that the top of Himalayas became visible from the city of New Delhi. These few examples may caution us not to revive overheated transportation, uh, which would lead to further environmental degradation when we get out of the current uh, pandemic predicament. Indeed, it may be a little simple-minded if we are only eager to vaccinate ourselves to revive the economy as soon as possible. Even before that, it is more important to think about uh, the socioeconomic structures we have been building that allow the virus to spread in such an extensive and rapid manner. Perhaps we may have to at least think back over the process of industrialization or what Gandhiji called modern civilization. In 1909, Gandhiji wrote in his Hindu Swaraj that it is my deliberate opinion that India is being ground down not under the English heel, but uh, under that of modern civilization. Observing capitalism developing in Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, Gandhiji found materialism to be the main characteristic of modern civilization in which uh, spirituality seemed to be undervalued. That is, the people of Europe today live in better built houses than they did a hundred years ago. And this is considered an emblem of civilization. Now they are enslaved by temptation of money and luxuries that money can buy. This civilization takes note neither of morality nor of religion. Gandhiji severely condemned material development driven by capitalists utilizing machinery as follows. At present, the machine is helping a small minority to live on the exploitation of the masses. And the motive force of this minority is not humanity and love of their kind, but greed and avarice. Machinery is the chief symbol of modern civilization it represents a great sin. To Gandhiji, civilization in the real sense of the term uh, consists not in the multiplication, uh, but in the deliberate and voluntary reduction of wants. At this point, he also found a weakness on the side of Indians who were uh, tempted by that civilization. He says, how can Manchester be blamed? We wore Manchester clothes, and that is why Manchester wore it. At this juncture, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to Gandhiji's criticism of railways in his Hindu Swaraj. He says, the railways too have spread a bubonic plague. plague. Uh, without them, masses could not move from place to place. They are the carriers of plague germs. Formerly, we had natural segregation. It is as if this statement well anticipated the current worldwide pandemic more than 100 years ahead of its time. And this was, this was even before the Spanish influenza. Another important argument of Gandhi's in his Hindu Swaraj is on doctors. He says, I have indulged in vice. I contract a disease. A doctor cures me. The odds are that I shall repeat the vice. The fact remains that the doctors induce us to indulge, and the result is that we have become deprived of self-control. To Gandhiji, Swaraj does not simply mean political independence or home rule of one nation 
but also means that we learn to rule ourselves, even at the level of the individual. To apply this idea uh, to, the, uh, to the current situation of our pandemic, we may have to discipline ourselves instead of expecting any effective government policies to prevent a disease. Each one of us may stay home uh, for say two or three weeks, not because of our government demands we do so, but truly spontaneously. It may look like Hartan that Indian people observed with Gandhiji uh, during the non-cooperation movement. If we did it uh, worldwide simultaneously, perhaps we wouldn't have to worry about the chronic cycle of infection that keeps peaking and waning indefinitely. This would be possible uh, without our relying upon possibly risky vaccination whose side effects are still unknown. Uh, back in the 19th century, European societies competed over natural resources and markets in non-Western ones to promote industrialization at home and divided the latter to occupy as their colonies. This drove them into world wars in the 20th century. Observing this course of history, Gandhiji firmly opposed the idea that India industrialized herself on a large scale. On the contrary, Gandhiji advocated revitalizing handicraft industries, including hand spinning and hand weaving. In India as well, uh, domestic capitalists started textile industries in the middle of the 19th century and produced cotton clothes by machines uh, on a larger scale in the early 20th century. Given such circumstances, Gandhiji conducted the Charka movement in order to provide the poor as, uh, with as many uh, working opportunities as possible. A charka is a traditional spinning wheel whose technology is simple and hence at an extremely low level. Based on the amount of clothes produced and the number of people employed around 1930, the per capita productivity of a charka would be calculated as only 1 63rd of a machine. Why then was Gandhiji sticking with this? despite its extremely low productivity. This question puzzled me for nearly 10 years. The answer I realized was that in a nutshell, the lower the technology, uh, the more people could have a share. Uh, that is, a chalka uh, would be potentially able to uh, create uh, 63 times more working opportunities than a machine. According to a Mainichi Shimbun online article uh, dated September 3rd this year, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Varma, recalled that there was a charka at his grandparents' home and they offered Kadi to the guard, and that His, his Excellency himself also enjoyed a tranquil time of spinning at school. Proud of Kadi as a symbol of freedom, His Excellency was uh, quoted as saying, the peace and non-violence that Gandhiji embodied throughout his life are also the guiding principles for me as a diplomat. Ultimately, Gandhiji thought as ideal an Indian society based on not cities, but on villages. An ideal village would be simple, but self-sufficient and possessing full powers as a basic unit of Indian Swaraj. He says, independence must begin at the bottom. Thus, every village will be a republic or panchayat uh, having full powers. A people living there would not be much interested in overseas markets and uh, resources, find, finding it unnecessary to hold any strong military power. To Gandhiji, it was a village-based India 
that would contribute to world peace. He says, independent India can only discharge her duty to as a growing world by adopting a simple but ennobled life by developing her thousands of cottage industries and living at peace with the world. And now uh, I am concluding this talk. It may not necessarily be our choice to vaccinate ourselves as soon as possible in order to revitalize urban-centered economies. The Japanese government carried out its go-to-travel and go-to-eat campaigns to aid the economy last year, but these campaigns also encouraged the pandemic, which was easily anticipated well in advance. We may have to boldly stop the whole economy instead until the virus is completely gone, not by any forceful government policy, but by our own willingness for self-control. The government would have to encourage non-violently uh, city-dwelling people to disperse uh, gradually to less populated areas. In the meantime, it should endeavor to collect uh, financial resources from every corner of society in order to support uh, people depending on the monetary economy for the moment. Defense expenses have to become the least uh, since now is not the time to fight among humans, uh, each one of whom is being equally threatened by the same enemy. The current predicament reminds us that the issue is not just how to suppress the pandemic technically, but what type of society we want to establish. The problem is that we always seek economic growth. To obtain more money means to take a greater share than others do, unless the scale of the whole economy is expanded. Since human activities are hitting the planetary boundary in the forms of global warming, deforestation, air and water pollution, species extinction, and so on, infinite economic growth is clearly impossible. In order to pursue uh, Ivan Illich's idea of conviviality, uh, both intra and intergenerational, we would have to give up our greed to remain in the human scale economy. Here, intergenerational conviviality is extremely important. Uh, since, for example, a global warming caused by people in the present day would victimize those in the future. The former would also have to stop wasting the limited resources on the earth so that the latter could also have access to them. Uh, today, uh, I talked about Gandhi's thoughts in conjunction with the current spread of COVID-19. Last but not least, I would like to share with you a passage of Gandhi's uh, that Ernst Schumacher quoted. Uh, that is, the earth would provide enough to satisfy everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. Here is a fundamental insight uh, for all of us who are responsible to establish a society that is economically, socially, and environmentally sound. This suggests to all of us a way out of all the blind alley of modern civilization. Thank you very much for your attention. Daniela.
Your Excellency Ambassador Sanjay Kumar Varma, dear brothers and sisters in India, it is a great honor for me to speak on this special occasion, Gandhiji's birthday. Thank you for having me today. I'm Kauri Kurehala. I'd like to introduce myself briefly. I was inspired by Gandhiji's Hindu Swaraj and went to Gujarat Vidyapit to study Gandhian philosophy from 2009 to 2017. I'm grateful for this precious opportunity to understand Gandhi's idea practically. I have chosen to talk about two topics which do not seem to be connected at first, Gandhian philosophy and the COVID-19 related crisis. However, I would like to explore what we can learn from Gandhi's ideas and ideals and how we can practice them to overcome the difficult situation that we are facing as COVID-19 related crisis. To understand it in a specific way, we will think a topic from two points of view. First, what is relevant from Gandhi's ideas and ideals? Second, what we can learn from the disciples who inherited Gandhian way of life and practice it. The reason why we deal with not only Gandhi but also his disciples is that they understood Gandhi's ideas and they made several efforts to put them into practice according to the environment in which they lived. Hence, I think their example will give us a new inspiration to practice Gandhi's idea today. Almost two years has been passed since the COVID-19 epidemic became widespread. COVID-19 has not only dramatically changed our lives, but also is dr drastically widening the gap between the people. For instance, unemployment and layoffs of non-regular workers became a problem due to the deteriorating business condition of companies all over the world. It is only a part of COVID-19 related crisis, but unfortunately, there is no doubt the gap between people will continue to widen. The current situation is that the disparity in people is far from Gandhi's ideals. According to Gandhi, the world of tomorrow will be, must be a society based on nonviolence. To achieve this objective, Gandhi introduced constructive program to India. He defined it as a constitution of Purna Swaraj by truthful and nonviolent means. He proclaimed that if people of India would honestly implement the constructive program, which consists of 18 activities, such as revival of village industries, Khadi, removal of untouchability, village sanitation, etc. India would attain Swaraj in one year, which became the famous slogan at the time. For addressing India's problem of hunger and unemployment in rural area, Gandhi proposed Swadeshi as a solution. He hoped to restore the self-reliance of the rural people by harnessing agriculture and traditional and home and cottage industries. He also hoped that every village in India would become self-supporting to a very great extent. His idea was that promoting production by the masses based on simple technology would strengthen the economic condition of rural people. He did not doubt that if this idea would be implemented properly, it would prove to be a revolutionary process against the spread of modern industrialization in India. He did not doubt that if the common folk of India would become self-reliant economically, it would enable India to move forward towards Swaraj. Hence, constructive program turned into an activity of creating a new society based on the first paying attention to a man and woman at the bottom of the social order. Gandhi's idea of constructive program is still relevant today in terms of devising activities to solve the social and economic problem facing society. 
we need to observe and think our situation and come up with our constructive program. As Gandhi always reminded us that there is no Gandhiism, but only Gandhian way of life, it is our responsibility to figure out what we need to do within the framework Gandhi had given. Now, in thinking about Gandhian way of life, it is helpful for us to know about the disciples who made an experimental effort to achieve Gandhi's ideals. Today, I will take Narayan Desai as an example. Narayan Desai was born in 1924 as the son of Mahadev Desai, Gandhi's secretary. He grew up Gandhi's Satyagra Ashram at Sabarmati, and Gandhi called him Babla, which means baby boy. And it is well known in Gujarat that he was a person who played in, at Gandhi's knees. Having decided not to go to school at age, age, age eight, he started helping Gandhi's secretarial work, which turned into a practical education for him. He grew up by living and working with Gandhi and being constantly by his side. After he left for the ashram at age 24, he engaged in the education of tribal people in South Gujarat. After Gandhi's death, he participated in the Buddha movement of Vinoba, J.P. Andolan, Shanti Sena, established Sampurna Kalanti Vidyale in Belchi, and also assigned as a chancellor of Gujarat Vidyapit. After the Gujarat riots in 2002 felt the need to spread Gandhi's message to India, he started performing Gandhi Kata. He dedicated his later years to conduct Gandhi Kata. The Gandhi Kata was an um, engaging innovation of Narayan Desai, communicating incidents and anecdotes from Gandhi's life interspersed with bhajan. It was a noble way of reviving Gandhian values among the people. According to Narayan Desai, the core of Gandhian philosophy is his 11 balls, constructive program, and satyagraha. In addition to that, it is essential to divide Gandhi's ideas into two parts, that is tattva and tantra, to understand Gandhi's essence of Gandhi's ideas and practice Gandhian way of life. He defined it tattva as those that are not limited time and space. On the other hand, tantra is that limited by time and space. Dividing Gandhi's idea into two parts not only avoids imitating what Gandhi did, but also helps us understand the essence of Gandhi's ideas. During my studies in India, I have a precious opportunity to stay with him in Belchi and accompany him during his Gandhi Kata. So, let me share this with you one memory that remains with me today. Uh, it was our during evening walk together in Belgium that he told me about his mission in life. He pointed out that life will be more meaningful if each of us has a mission in life. According to him, the definition of life mission is that um, activity that one wants to do not only this only the not only in this life but also in the next life and also an activity that one can express oneself and truly enjoy to respond to this i ask him then what what is that admission he looked at me with very kind eyes and taking my hands and replied it is Gandhi. I will be doing Gandhi Kata until the day I die. I still remember at the moment I felt I felt unspeakable gratitude from the bottom of my heart that I have a, I have a person in my life who works with Gandhi and who dedicate his life to him. 
So what is important for us to practice Gandhian way of life from now on? Naren Desai gave me a framework to think about how to live in the future. I would like to share this with you because I think this is, this is not something I should think about alone, but something that we should think about together. We need to consider these three issues for the future. A problem of individuals, a problem between individual and society, a problem between individual and nature. We must think these three issues in the context of our situation and decide what we can do and what we will do. I believe that living Gandhian philosophy means to move forward to see if one's actions are in the direction of truth and nonviolence. But how can we be sure that our actions are in the light of truth and nonviolence? Gandhi left the following words in 1948. I will give you a talisman. Whenever you are in doubt or when the self becomes too much with you, apply the following test. Recall the face of the poorest and wickedest man whom you may have seen and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him. Will he gain anything by it? Will it restore him to a control of, over his own life and destiny? In other words, will it lead to Swaraj for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? Then you will find your doubts and yourself melt away. This is a famous quote, which is known as Gandhi's talisman. The COVID-19 crisis can easily make us indifferent to suffering of others and self-centered. That is why in such a crucial situation, we need to remember Gandhi's these words and live each day with them. In addition to that, it is an opportunity for us to reflect on our way of life and change our old mindset. Moreover, what is necessary today for us is not to limit the study of Gandhi to the domain of his thought, but to take it into a practical plane of doing, experimenting, and thus learning. Gandhi way has a transformative content in it, and that is what should be grasped and translated into practice. Thank you for listening. Hello. Message for the birth celebration of Mahatma Gandhi at the Embassy of India, Tokyo, October 2nd, 2nd 2021. My title is Learning from Gandhiji for us to survive the COVID-19 crisis. Namaste. It is truly a great honor and joy for me to speak at the gathering to celebrate the birth of Mahatma Gandhi. I would like to thank the Ambassador Sanjay Kumar Varma and Professor Siddharth Singh, the Director of the Vivekananda Culture Center, for organizing the occasion and for inviting me. I am Ayako Uno, a research fellow at the Institute of Asian Culture Studies of the International Christian University in Tokyo. Today it is with great joy that I share the message of Gandhiji and commemorate his birthday with you. I would like to give a message from my own humble experience of learning from Gandhiji over the years, not only as a researcher, but as an ordinary person, as a wife and a mother living under the threats of COVID-19. I sincerely hope you may find my message meaningful in some ways for surviving and overcoming the difficulties which we are all facing today. First, I would like to share the image of learning from Gandhiji. Many of you may have heard of Mahadev Desai, who was Gandhiji's 
most reliable and devoted personal secretary for more than 25 years until his death at 50 years old in 1942 when he was in prison with Gandhiji. Mahadev's son, Narayan Desai, was born and brought up in Gandhiji's ashram, literally playing on, his, on the knees of Gandhiji. When Narayan grew older, he worked with his father to support Gandhiji. Thus, Narayan had Gandhiji's love and trust imbibed in his body and soul so deeply that Narayan Desai continued to devote his life as a staunch Gandhian until his death in 2015. In his late years, Narayan began in order to realize his lifelong mission of bringing Gandhiji's life and message alive to the ordinary people of India. He began Gandhi Kata, or the narrative of Gandhiji, where he would tell the stories and sing songs of the Gandhiji's whole life in Gujarati for the people, taking more than five days to present at many various places. Also, Narayan wrote a huge four-volume biography on Gandhiji in Gujarati, which was later translated to English in 2009. This English version, titled My Life is My Message, I have been leading for 10 years with my mentor and friends at ICU Gandhi Study Group until we had to stop the meeting for a while due to COVID-19. It is indeed, this book is indeed a beautiful book, helping us to understand the inner and outer struggles of Gandhiji, how he progressed step by step towards the light or truth. It was written not as information, but as an invitation for us all to join Gandhiji in our own progress. As you may know, there are already hundreds of biographies and books about Gandhiji. So why would Narayan want to add another? What would you think? Narayan writes in his preface of the book that he is writing this book to share the joy of living in the presence of Gandhiji. So I quote from his preface, Narayan says, in the preface, I have been moved to write it simply to share with readers the joys of being in Gandhi's constant presence. What does this mean? Let me share with you what Narayan writes further in his preface. I quote, as a child, Narayan says, as a child, Gandhi was more a friend to me than a leader or a Mahatma. In my adolescence, he was my taskmaster when I helped my father in his secretariat. Even after Gandhi's passing away, I have tried to live a life that I think would have met his approval. Spending one third of my life in his physical presence and the rest in his spiritual presence has been a most blissful experience for me. Blissful means a lot of joy. Blissful experience for me. Sharing one's joy with the rest of the world is perhaps the surest way to multiply the joy." End of quote. So you see, Narayan wrote this book because he wanted to share the joy of living in Gandhi's constant presence, which continued even after Gandhiji passed away. Since then, Narayan lived in Gandhiji's spiritual presence. And why he wanted to share the joy? It is because sharing joy is the best way to multiply the joy. This is the wonderful message of Narayan Desai, that even today we are all living in the constant presence of Gandhiji, and he wants us to realize the joy and multiply the joy of it by sharing. This is the image of what learning from Gandhiji means, and I would like to share with you today. But actually, when we look at our world today, we see that there are so many sufferings and pain, so much division and fighting going on among the people and nations. 
where constant economic and political competitions are depriving, depriving people of their peace, if not their lives. It is no wonder if we may feel very sad and depressed. Added to this grim situation from last year, the world is, at, world is in utter confusion and at a loss due to the pandemic caused by COVID-19. Although we may wish that things would sooner or later be back to what we think was normal, I am afraid that after COVID, things would not be the same. I tell my daughters that we are living witnesses to this COVID-19, which will be another decisive turning point in the history of humanity. Years from now, if humanity still survives on Earth, younger generations of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren might be surprised to learn that we lived through the COVID and exclaim, Oh, you were there when the COVID-19 hit the world? What was, it, what was it like before the COVID? Please tell us, you know. By that time, since so many changes were brought about by the pandemic, it may be difficult to imagine for the future generations how the people used to live before the COVID. What can we ordinary people do in this world now to make it a little bit better for the future generations? You know the present situation very well, but let me review briefly what were the changes brought about to our daily lives by COVID-19. Now, after the COVID, we are unable to meet each other face to face, hug our dear people, hug our friends, no. No sing together at a karaoke or at the community center. Young and old are suffering from lack of physical touch, unable to get together in person. I have been teaching university classes online and perhaps information can be communicated by, but I constantly feel, how could we learn from each other without meeting face to face? COVID-19 has taken away our real life experiences, which ties relationship, which, which ties relationships which, with each other. Even among family members, we cannot take care of our loved ones once they are put in hospitals and care institutions because the patients must be separated to be protected from COVID. Separated, we lose the chance to exchange loving glances and caring words and even smiles with each other. COVID has affected not only on the personal level, but changes hit the society level as well. For example, many traditional festivals had to be canceled, causing many valuable experiences to get lost without chances to hand them to younger generations. It used to be that at these festivals, celebrating and thanking together for everything given, we could eat and drink and be merry and these joyful experiences together helped to bind people together as a living community. Not only celebrations, but we have lost occasions where we could mourn and share the sadness and pain of the loss of dear ones together. How could these be replaced by online events? I don't really know. Thus, it is no wonder that the strangers and unknown people become threatening presence. This fear of others have been already spreading, spreading among us in modern times slowly over many years, but with the COVID-19, it has taken a more serious and acute turn. We are constantly put under fear of getting contaminated and sick by invisible substances which might be carried by each other. So we are living under constant fear, afraid, afraid, and afraid. Under this situation, it is no wonder we allow and rely on, rely on more and more control by the government over our daily lives. In this situation, what would Gandhiji have said to us? As you know, Gandhiji was a man of faith or a man of God, experimenting all his life in search for truth, who led his life as a selfless servant. One of the most important messages of Gandhiji 
which galvanized the Indian people in their struggle for freedom was do not fear. How could one be so brave as Gandhiji today in this time of fear and anxiety? Let us learn the secret from Gandhiji. In 1909, Gandhiji wrote his Hindu Swaraj or Indian Home Rule, where he stated that he is deeply tormented by the painful, painful situation of India and radically criticized the modern civilization as the cause, being immoral, leading people to lose self-control. Gandhiji lamented, we are turning away from God. Facing this predicament, Gandhiji presented in Hindu Swaraj the realization of Swaraj or self-rule or freedom as the sole aim for the Indian people and the whole union and the whole humanity. Swaraj is not just the political independence, but it means to learn to rule ourselves, which will lead us to know who we are. This is what Gandhiji wrote in Hindu Swaraj. At the beginning of 20th century, when Hindu Swaraj was written, the modern civilization was ruling the West and was on the process of conquering the rest of the world. Thus, Gandhiji could state in Hindu Swaraj with rare clarity that India still has time to get rid of modern civilization, but time is running out day by day. Gandhiji led the people of India in the great nonviolent struggle for freedom, but the partition shattered his dream, lifelong dream of Swaraj for all. Now today, we are born and raised as the children of the modern civilization, and, and thus we cannot see, as Gandhiji did, what is the central problem of today's world. But living under the COVID-19 may give us a rare chance to realize our own yearning, our, our own yearning for Swaraj hidden deep inside ourselves. Today, we are all experiencing that it is painful and sad to be isolated from each other. At the same time, we are fearful and full of distrust with each other and the world. In other words, we are really lacking faith. Why is that so? I think it is because only by meeting each other, working with others and serving each other that we can learn and realize who we are. This leads to the essence of Gandhiji's faith. Who are we? Let us look at the foundation of Gandhiji's faith, which was precisely expressed in response to questions posed by S. Radhakrishnan, Radhakrishnan, a philosopher who later became the second president of India. Gandhiji said, We are all sparks of truth. The sum total of these sparks is indescribable as yet unknown truth, which is God. I am being, led, being daily led near to it by constant prayer. This is what Gandhiji wrote. Here, Gandhiji sees that we are all sparks, flashes of little lights, all sparks of truth, that is, all of us are part of unity or one, which he calls truth or God, which is the source and the goal of the light. Here, Gandhiji does not claim that he has already reached the goal or already knows God, but he humbly states as yet unknown truth. So Gandhiji himself, as all the others, need to be led near to the truth or the light by constant daily prayer. So you see that Gandhiji is inviting us all to see that all of us, including you and me, is part of the whole. Once we are led to see that we are all sparks of truth, we should not fear or be afraid of others. However, this realization is very difficult to reach since we are so full of our own wants and worries, our selfish desires. Gandhiji as a foreigner shows us the way. To get rid of our selfishness is only possible by looking up at the light 
and walking humbly on paths of selfless service and by constant, constant prayers. This seems to be not an easy path to follow, but that path is, according to Gandhiji and Narayan Desai, and those who follow the way, full of joy, joyful. I know that in the world today, it is so difficult to be joyful. We cannot meet each other, we cannot travel freely without worries, we are afraid, etc., etc. But as Gandhiji says, if we realize who we really are, that is, the sparks of light of truth, we cannot but be joyful and grateful, and moreover, we can bring our little light to those who are next to us, near to us, by sharing our joys, by praying for each other. It is not that we can bring about a great revolution in the world, but we can turn ourselves upside down. But by awakening to Gandhiji's way of seeing the world. In this world today, under the crisis of COVID-19, Gandhiji continues to invite us through his spiritual, spiritual presence, inviting us to see the little light inside each of us and in all the other people, and let the light shine a little bit outside, giving and caring the others, praying for others, so that the people around you can enjoy the warmth and light emitted through you. Such a way of living will surely increase the joy for yourself and for all around you. This way of living is taught from ancient times in various traditional thoughts. And in Japan, for example, there is an old testament of wisdom. In Buddhist tradition, expressed as let each be a lamp and light up the corner where you are. Ichigu wo terasu. So maybe this teaching is nothing new for you. Gandhiji himself said that he has nothing new to teach the world, but he teaches us as old as hills. But as we have forgotten all these ancient wisdoms, it is good to remember through living examples such as Gandhiji so that we would not be ruled by the darkness surrounded, surrounding us right now. Let us see our own inner light and try to proceed step by step towards the truth or the light, shedding our selfishness and giving out the inner light to others despite the surrounding darkness of this world, so that the future generations may receive the light too. Thank you for listening to my little message. Namaste. Namaste, Konnichiwa. Vivekanand Cultural Center Embassy of India, Tokyo welcomes you all on this special day of Gandhi Jayanti. On this day, students of Vivekanand Cultural Center are reciting some shlokas from Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Let us start this with this shloka. Sarvopnishado gavo Dugdhago palanandanaha Parthavatsa sudhir bhokta Dugdham gita mritam maha
अर्जुनल वाचा स्थित रक्तस्य काबाशा समाधिस्तस्य केशवा स्थिति किं प्रभाषेता किमासीत रजेत किं Namaste, Konnichiwa. Wish you all a very happy Gandhi Jayanti on behalf of Vivekanand Cultural Center, Embassy of India, Tokyo. As much as we are getting entangled in the violent and conflicting world, we realize the importance of great souls like Mahatma Gandhi in this world. Mahatma Gandhi's teachings are of universal value and his teachings don't attach any label of religion, caste, creed, race or nationality with it. If someone asks us to summarize Mahatma Gandhi's philosophy into three words, then I would suggest that those words may be truth, non-violence and simplicity. Nothing is or exists in reality except truth. Mahatma Gandhi claims that it is more correct to say that truth is God than to claim that God is truth. This truth was non-negotiable for Mahatma Gandhi. He never got scared of expressing the truth even at the cost of his popularity. Whenever he found any untruthful things happening even in the most sacred places of his time. He didn't feel any fear of opposing it. Mahatma Gandhi's non-violence was also a form of courage. He truly believed that non-violence cannot be the weapon of weak people. Gandhi pronounced, My religion is based on truth and non-violence. Truth is my God, and non-violence is the means of realizing Him. The seat of non-violence should be in the heart, and it must be an inseparable part of our being. Violence is done at three levels, bodily, verbally, and mentally. Gandhi was well convinced that we should denounce violence at all these three levels. Then only we can be the most courageous person. 
Another virtue that Gandhi practiced more than he taught was simplicity. His life is the biggest example of simplicity and he brought immense changes in Indian society by experimenting with the simplest thing of life like charkha, salt and other small things. He made us realize that the greatest philosophy of life can be simplest too. It doesn't need to be complicated. He left this world with five messages of simple life. Number one, accumulate little. Number two, eat simple food. Number three, dress simply. Number four, lead a simple and stress-free life. And number five, let your life be your message. Let's pay our sincere homage to Mahatma Gandhi by imbibing his teachings on this auspicious occasion. I take this opportunity to extend my sincere thanks to Honorable Chaljit Defer of India to Japan, Sri Mayank Joshi Ji, and all the Japanese scholars, Gandhian scholars, who enlightened us by their speeches in today's program hosted by Vivekanand Cultural Center. We are also thankful to all the artists who participated in today's event and you all for watching this program. We expect your continued support to the noble efforts of Vivekanand Cultural Center Embassy of India, Tokyo. Thanks a lot. Domo arigatou gozaimashita. Namaste.